Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to our academic meeting. Um, I thought I would uh, start the meeting um, by uh, making um, a few comments um, in memory of uh, Yvonne Schindler. It's with a profound and tremendous sense of sadness uh, that I inform you of her unexpected demise on Tuesday this week uh, at the age of 64. Uh, Yvonne was a popular member of our department who was committed to her patients and her research in the hypertension clinic. She had the loveliest smile and had spoken to Brian um, and many other members of our department. That seems to be the enduring quality that many of us will remember her for. Of course, she also cared for many of our colleagues and ensured that um, they not only had improved and controlled blood pressure, but also improved cardiovascular health. She is survived by her husband, uh, Brian Rayner, who is known to many of you as a professor in our department. There are four children, Andrew, Francis, Michael, and Nandi, as well as her mother, Ines, and her brother, David. I would like to acknowledge um, over these last two days uh, the incredible support that many of you have uh, provided uh, to Brian and the family, and on their behalf, uh, to thank you for this. And I thought that uh, in acknowledging um, the loss of a friend and colleague of ours, um, um, we can start this meeting by observing a moment of silence in Yvonne's honor. Thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over to Graham uh, to chair the meeting for today. Graham, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Ntobeko. Um, so it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce our invited uh, speaker today, who's one of our colleagues at UCT in Khrudiskia, uh, Richard van Salesmith. Uh, Richard is obviously a consultant pulmonologist uh, in the E16 Respiratory Clinic. Uh, and is head of the Hrutskia uh, Smoking Cessation Services. He's also the South African representative on the Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease or GOLD uh, Assembly. And uh, Richard's really ideally placed um, to give us an update on COPD with the title of his talk, COPD from 1820 to 2020, Changing Treatment Paradigms. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the talk. Thanks, thanks very much for agreeing, Richard. Thanks, Graham, for, for having me, and nice to, to be um, on this platform. Let me share my screen, and then we can get that going. Graham, can you just confirm you can see my title slide? Can see it, fine, yeah. Okay, brilliant. So what I thought um, I would do this afternoon, um, rather than give you a sort of didactic lecture on how we should or shouldn't treat COPD in 2020, um, I thought I'd take a little bit of a, a historical look at where we've come from. There's some fascinating things uh, in the history of COPD, even if you're not a pulmonologist. And then just sort of take you through how the landscape has changed in terms of COPD thinking, COPD management, and where we uh, need to go in the future. In terms of conflicts of interest, um, as Graham mentioned, I am the South African representative on the Gold Committee, but only from this year. So I take no responsibility for anything Gold has said up until this point. And I have consulted with, um, performed clinical trials with many of the pharmaceutical companies and obviously we'll be talking about quite a lot of medication uh, today. So if we go back to the really, really, really early days of when we can first see any evidence uh, of people thinking about COPD, the first person uh, is 
Theophil Bonnet in 1679. He was an uh, anatomy professor uh, and in Geneva, and he is probably the earliest description um, of something that looks potentially like COPD or emphysema, where he described voluminous lungs. The next sort of major uh, reference to, to COPD in its early forms is Giovanni Battista Morgani, uh, almost 100 years later. Uh, similarly, uh, in, uh, someone interested in basic anatomy, and he described turgid lugs. And so we then jump to some other major milestones and when we really start seeing the beginnings of what we now recognize as COPD. And so Charles Badham, 1814, a London physician, he coined the term chronic bronchitis, uh, chronic cough and sputum production. And then really 1821, and we see that, that René Lenac, whose second name was Theophile, who's the same as um, Bonnet in 1679, interestingly, he was the first person who described emphysema. And in 1860, he developed something that we all use um, and hasten to add that it wasn't used, wasn't developed initially for pulmonology, but he is, he is uh, attributed to being the one that developed the stethoscope. And the first time he used it was to try and hear the fetal heartbeat in a pregnant woman. So he's, he is the one who we give the honor of being the originator of a stethoscope. And then lung function was actually first described in 1846 by a surgeon. Um, and John Hutchinson is the person that has been uh, again accredited for developing the spirometer. And he described the vital capacity or the capacity of life. And then later on in uh, 1947, now again, not a pulmonologist, a pharmacologist, uh, Robert Tefieu, he um, wrote in his uh, journals and in his manuscripts, this capacity of pulmonary that was utilizable for effort, excuse my paraphrasing the French, the CPUE. And that was then changed by the English to volume ex um, expired maximum one second. Again, please excuse my French. And this is where we start to see the terms vital capacity and VEMS change to FEV1 around about 1957. So a slightly checkered history, um, not really de um, developed by pulmonologists. We had surgeons, pharmacologists involved, and we now start seeing the beginnings of um, understanding physiology um, and lung function. And then really fast tracking through to, to the modern era, there were a multitude of um, meetings and symposium between both the American Thoracic Society and the European respiratory groupings and the terms emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis tends to be the American term whereas emphysema was the British term. And it took many forms. You can see I've listed the various names that have been called what we now recognize as COPD. And what's interesting is none of them are particularly helpful. And as much as COPD also isn't a particularly helpful term, but we're stuck with it from 1965. The two components remain emphysema and chronic bronchitis. And so that's the term uh, we are stuck with. And as I said, it's not particularly uh, very helpful. So let's then look at some other important milestones in terms of how our understanding of COPD has changed. So this is the classic fletcher pito curve from 1977. And I only learned this past weekend, um, having sat through a two hour symposium on COPD, which uh, I won't subject you to this afternoon. But this is actually figure one from the fletcher pito curve and actually figure two of the fletcher pito curve um, paper looks a whole lot um, more interesting and helpful. And I'll, I'll show you um, more or less what that curve, curve was talking about. But traditionally, we always thought that if you didn't smoke, your lung function declined over time. If you smoked the red line, your lung function drops off dramatically. And if you, sorry, um, if you stopped smoking, you would then tail off on the blue line. 
A couple of assumptions. One, that your lung function was 100% at age 25 and nothing happened before the age of 25. And that there really were sort of two options with and without smoking. Subsequent to that, now this is 2002. This is from a lung health study. This really was the first data to convincingly show that if you stopped smoking um, completely, your lung function trajectory was, was much more flat compared to those that carried on smoking. And even intermittent smoking, unfortunately, is not as good as stopping completely. Again, you will see that um, the lung function um, starting was fairly high. Framingham Lung Study showed some more interesting data, again, looking at longitudinal function. And now you will see for the first time that lung function is now being documented before the age of 20. And very similar to what we saw in the lung health study, if you stop smoking at various ages, the rate of decline uh, takes a different trajectory. What is a little bit concerning is that the benefit actually of stopping smoking when you're over the age of 40 really is not as good, unfortunately, in terms of lung function as we would like to think. And very recently now bringing you up to 2019, this is the sort of current thinking around lung function over time. And a very similar graph was actually drawn, as I said, the figure two from that original Fletcher-Peter curve. And you will see that lung function increases. There's a huge increase in lung function from late childhood through puberty, roughly to around about 20 to 25 when you hit your peak. But certain people will never hit the absolute high peak, will start lower and fall off quicker. Some may start lower and follow the same trajectory. And so there isn't a standardized, uh, what's now referred to as flight path for lung function. It very much depends where you start. Um, and from where you start, it depends how fast you're going down as to how early we're going to see lung changes. So it's not that straightforward that you start smoking and you develop COPD. And so just to make things a little bit more complicated, and I had this conversation with a colleague to say they didn't draw the diagram I'm drawing now because it's too complicated or too much spaghetti-like to put in a paper. But if you assume that that red line is so-called normal, you have a couple of options. If you smoke, theoretically, you will drop off earlier if you're an average smoker. And if you stop smoking, your trajectory traces that more or less of a non-smoker. However, if you are poor and malnourished, certainly during childhood, uh, or have other respiratory illnesses, you may never hit that particular peak and you may fall off at the same rate. If you are poor, malnourished, living with HIV and have had previous TB, you may similarly never hit the peak. It may be worse and you may fall off faster. And last of worst, if you are poor, malnourished, living with HIV, previously had TB and smoke, your lung function may follow a different trajectory. And the challenge we have is that we don't have longitudinal cohorts of patients big enough that have looked at all these various potential impacts. And the suggestion is that we should be doing lung function at um, early childhood, age six, when you hit junior school, before you hit high school, when you come out of high school so that we can actually work out where you are in terms of the trajectory. Are you going to hit your peak or not and potentially intervene? But that's something for the future. So the definition of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is not really particularly helpful, but it is what it is and this is what we have to deal with. It's defined by Gold, and I'll come back to who Gold is in a moment. A COPD is a common, preventable, and treatable disease characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation that is due to airway and or alveolar abnormalities, usually caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases. And whenever you have a um, definition of a disease that has words like usually or characterized by, you can realize that we're probably talking more about a syndrome uh, or a collection, uh, as it were, of diseases rather than a single entity. The usually progressive was 2015, that's come out, and enhanced chronic inflammatory response has also come out, and I will share some of the information as to why that has changed. 
How prevalent is COPD? How important is it? Well, the estimations vary across the world depending where you are. It also depends how you define COPD, and I don't even want to go into that space. But somewhere in the region of 12% um, is where we're looking at across the world. And obviously, it very much depends where you are and the exposures that you um, are exposed to. So bringing it back to some treatment, and I'm going to get into the guidelines. Um, if you do recognize your handwriting on the script, please accept my apologies for being brutal and honest about your prescription. Uh, and I'm happy to help you out at a later date. But this is a script from a very preeminent institution in South Africa. You will see the diagnosis there it says severe COPD. And if you realize that um, the person clearly wasn't trained in pulmonology because there's no ICD-10 code and Clive Davids would have killed you if you hadn't put the ICD-10 code in. Let's just go through the script and I've highlighted there because the um, handwriting is difficult to read. So prednisone 60 milligrams daily. Generally speaking, we would say 30 to 40 milligrams is more than enough. Above 40 milligrams, you're just getting side effects with no real benefit. Paracetamol is fine. Comoxiclav one gram BD for four over five. I'm assuming that's four out of seven. And this is where the script really gets interesting. So Budaflam two puffs BD, which is budesonide, usually comes in a 200 microgram inhaler. So that will be 400 micrograms twice a day. Astavent two puffs PRN. Ipvent two puffs daily. Ipvent is ipratropium bromide. It's a 40 microgram uh, inhaler. So that would be 80, milligram, 80 micrograms daily, but it only works for, for between four and six hours. So if you're not using it six hourly, it's a complete waste of time. And then Seraflow two puffs speedy. Well, Seraflow is a combination of salmitrol and fluticasone. There are multiple uh, strengths that you can use, which isn't defined. And this patient then is on two uh, inhaled corticosteroids at significant dose um, with the addition of salmitrol. So this is completely not the kind of script we would like to see for a patient with COPD. So I'm going to use Star Wars as, as an analogy for the gold guidelines and start with a galaxy far, far away. Gold is the global initiative for chronic obstructive lung disease. And then there's GINA, which is the same type of body, but for, for asthma. Gold guidelines first uh, came into, into um, prominence around about 2007. And it was called a strategy for the diagnosis, diagnosis management and prevention of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So they've never referred to themselves as a guideline. It's a strategy document, which further creates significant problems because medical funders and um, review bodies see it as a guideline, but it's a strategy document, which they say you should be um, then tailoring to your local uh, situation, but often that doesn't happen. Um, so gold started, let's say in 2007, more or less. And you can see that in the early, in the early days of COPD, we used to refer to COPD as a stage, stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four, very much like how we stage cancer. And one of the big issues around the staging of COPD, that it was predominantly based on lung function and it had a staging. So if you were stage one, well, don't worry, you're only stage one. If you're stage four, that's almost at death's door, like with stage four cancer, um, and you've got no hope. That wasn't very um, helpful in terms of the understanding of COPD, but also it didn't predict lung function uh, was not a very good predictor of long-term survival, long-term outcome. And you can see here in terms of the therapy, very early on, we had um, inhaled corticosteroids. Grade three, when your lung function was less than 50%, was the addition of a steroid, if not earlier than that. So staging of COPD wasn't helpful. And so they changed that um, later on to grading. This is the South African guidelines in 2011. We similarly still had stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Um, we used to use the old MRC. We now use the MMRC, which 
is essentially a shift across by one. Um, and similarly in the South African guidelines, you will see in the bottom, it's not um, very big, that inhaled corticosteroids came in, in very early in moderate COPD with a lung function even between 50 and 80%. The recommendation was that you'd add uh, in an inhaled corticosteroid. So we did away with staging and we went to grading. Now, I'm sure many of you aren't aware of this. Graham will be very familiar with it as I am. It's called the Norwood scale. That a grading, a slowly progressive grading is much better than a staging. And most important to recognize that baldness does not predict mortality. So goal then, we had stage one, two, three, four, um, and then we changed to grades. And then it got even more confusing, very much like the Star Wars universe. And gold then changed into boxes. So you were gold A, B, C, and D. Now the reason that they changed from a staging grading into a box type category was that the focus then became on symptoms and based on your shortness of breath, how many exacerbations you had and your lung function, you were then grouped into an A, B, C, D and this A, B, C, D has persisted subsequent to that. You will see on, your, on the right hand side, this is the table of initial pharmacotherapy. You had a recommended first choice, an alternative second choice, and a third uh, option of possibilities. So again, this is very much a strategy rather than a guideline because you could choose anything across any of these levels. And then unfortunately, gold became ridiculous and almost impossible to understand very similar to the current Star Wars um, empire where there are multiple spin-offs um, and different episodes that happen before or after other ones. And so it has become quite confusing. So very much unlike the diabetes and cardiovascular guidelines where you have straightforward tables, the gold guidelines now have an initial choice, still the group A, B, C, or D, and then a follow-up choice. And as soon as you have lines and boxes and boxes in lines, you can understand how exceedingly confusing this will be for any practitioner to try and work out what am I supposed to be doing with this. And it really is this group D, the severe group that really is the confusing group. The rest is actually quite straightforward. And so I'm gonna focus on why the change has occurred in this group D. Essentially, group A is a short-acting bronchodilator if you're not particularly symptomatic. Group B, if you are symptomatic, and the MMRC cutoff here is being able to keep up with your friends uh, on the flat. If you can't, you're a group B, and then you need a long-acting bronchodilator, either a LABA on its own or a LAMA on its own. And so I'm really going to focus on the group D, the more severe group, because this is where certainly in Kuroskia we're seeing the majority of our patients and where the debate, the discussion, um, and the complexity lies in terms of how best to manage this particular group of patients. So GOLD, as I said, is a global initiative. I've highlighted there with a little red arrow, the single Egyptian who has been on the GOLD guidelines um, for the last couple of years. There's no other representation from Africa at all. Um, and so really these, although called a global initiative, um, haven't had any input really from many of the low and middle income countries. But let's then quickly go back to the starting point for COPD management, the non-debatables, which should be applied to all patients. Clearly smoking cessation uh, reduces the decline in FEV1, reduces the risk for pneumonia, cancer, cardiovascular risks, it goes without saying. Pulmonary rehabilitation surprisingly has very, very good impact uh, on long-term symptoms and mortality. It is very underused, uh, partly because um, it is just not funded, unlike cardiac rehab, uh, takes time and effort, but it's something that we are busy working on. Vaccination, both influenza and pneumococcal have shown to be of benefit. And then importantly, to manage comorbidities, particularly depression, cardiovascular disease. So this goes without saying is undebatable across all patients with COPD. And the issue then comes to that of what's referred to as the dual bronchodilator debate. 
uh, and I have um, spelt it correctly there as dual bronchodilators rather than dual bronchodilators, and I'll come back to the issue of dual bronchodilators in a moment. So where did we start? The major pivotal study in COPD is the TORCH study. This was published now in 2007. And what the TORCH study showed was that the addition of a inhaled corticosteroid to a bronchodilator significantly reduced exacerbations. And so this in COPD was where the importance of steroids came in, that if you added an inhaled corticosteroid to a bronchodilator, you had a significant reduction in exacerbations. Subsequent to that have been many meta-analyses um, over many years, and two important things have come out. One is that there is a significant risk for developing pneumonia when on an inhaled corticosteroid. So you do reduce the risk of exacerbations, but you have the increased risk um, of pneumonia. So gold then you will see in the early guidelines had inhaled corticosteroids very early on. And then subsequent 2016 and 2017, you will see the dotted line across the gold box is the exacerbation line. And inhaled corticosteroids are only reserved for this group of patients who have frequent exacerbations. One hospitalization or more than or two or more exacerbations or one hospitalization. And then you will see now in the 2017 diagram, this beginning of this multiple combination of whether you have two bronchodilators and a steroid and how you solve this. So the reason this option of inhaled corticosteroid or LAMA has changed is because of the issue of dual bronchodilators. So the FLAME study came out in 2016. This was a Novartis study that looked at the combination of indicatrol and glycopyronium versus salmitrol and fruticasone. So a once daily LABA LAMA versus a twice daily LABA ICS. And so in this study, they demonstrated that the combination of indicatrol and glycopyronium significantly reduced the risk of exacerbations compared to the steroid and the bronchodilator um, together. If you look at the exacerbation rates, you can see that the overall exacerbation rate fell. It's not significantly, uh, I mean, it's not a huge number when um, you look at the absolute risk reduction, but clearly two bronchodilators appear to be better than a bronchodilator and an inhaled corticosteroid in exacerbation reduction. And so that then changed Gold's mind. And so Gold then put the LABA LAMA as the first choice in patients who were, had significant exacerbations. Move on two years and we now have the impact study. This is now GSK study where they looked at the combination of fruticasone furate in health corticosteroid, eumecladinium, the LAMA, and valanterol, the LABA as a once daily so-called triple versus the two options of doubles, either two bronchodilators or a bronchodilator steroid. And interestingly in this study, apart from the fact that the triple seemed to do better than either of the two doubles, that the LABA ICS seemed to reduce exacerbations better than the LABA LAMA. Now the details as to why this is the case um, is a lecture in and of itself. But suffice to say, we have one study showing that a LABA LAMA is better and another study showing that a LABA ICS seems to be better. In that particular study, the, they showed that the risk for pneumonia was still there. And again, with the triple compared to dual bronchodilator, you had a significantly higher risk uh, of developing pneumonia. So although you reduced your exacerbations, you had a higher risk um, of pneumonia. And then move forward right the way through now to 2020. This was published uh, a couple of weeks ago. This is now the ethos study. This is now AstraZeneca's study, looking at a twice daily combination of budesonide, uh, glycopyrrolate, and formoterol. So you will recognize glycopyrrolate from your 
anesthesia days for motrol and budesonide. Uh, and this is a twice daily uh, triple versus double study. And so in this particular study, they actually then randomized patients um, according to the eosinophil count because the thinking was that potentially eosinophils were important um, as a phenotype, as a marker for COPD exacerbations. And again, this probably deserves a, a 45 minute unpack on its own, but I'll save you um, that and just summarize it to show you that the triple, so the LABA, LAMA and ICS, um, had a more uh, or greater impact on um, mortality. So we had a greater re uh, reduction in mortality in the triple. It did come with a cost of more pneumonia. Um, the triple had less exacerbations than the other. But interestingly, what it showed was that the medium triple, so if you add LABA, LAMA and ICS, but with a medium dose steroid, it seemed to perform as well and if not better than the high dose LABA ICS. So it will further confuse the, the issue in terms of where we need to position the LABA and the LAMA. So currently where do we stand in terms of goal guidelines and recommendation as to what we should be doing with COPD? So as I mentioned, we, once you've made the diagnosis, the question then is to ask a patient simply, do you or do you not, or can you or can you not keep up with your friends on the flat? And if you can't, you're a group B. If you can, you're a group A. If you can keep up with your friends, you've got mild shortness of breath and a short acting bronchodilator is your therapy of choice. If you can't keep up with your friends, in other words, you are limited by significant shortness of breath, a long acting bronchodilator, so either a LABA or a LAMA would be your choice. You can try one or the other. If one doesn't work, you can try the other one or you can try both. If you are a frequent exacerbator and so you have got significant exacerbations, more than two moderate that's requiring oral steroids or one leading to hospitalization, you then, sorry, have the choice then of starting with a LAMA would be choice one, or a LABA LAMA, so two bronchodilators, or a LABA ICS. And the issue here is that with the LABA ICS, the current suggestion is that if you have a history of asthma in childhood, but now have COPD, that potentially a LABA ICS might be of use. And if you have a eosinophil count, uh, of greater than 350, some say greater than 150, that's still up for debate, is where you now uh, should be starting. But much of the, the, the evidence now, and I can, will see it coming from international guidelines, is that once you're in this group D, you really should be on a LABA LAMA ICS. Now you could argue that that's overkill, but within this group, if you are not responding to your first choice, if you're not responding to the two bronchodilators or the bronchodilator and a steroid, you may well want to go to a triple. I've heard it said at several meetings, well, why waste your time going from a single to a double? Why not just start all patients on a triple? It's a little bit like a cardiologist saying, well, I'm just gonna add an antiplatelet now after your first heart attack. And then after the second heart attack, I'm gonna add the antiplatelet and the ACE inhibitor. And after the third one, um, because we know that each exacerbation that you have damages your lungs and reduces your overall lung function and increases your rate of decline. So this particular area remains a very confusing space for most of us. Um, and hopefully we will get some idea as we put our heads together in relation to what we should be doing in terms of the medication. So, End of last year, we put together the South African uh, Thoracic Society position statement on the management of COPD. We've tried our best to simplify it and we've simply gone for a mild, moderate and severe approach based very similar on the gold A, B and D. The gold group C, no one really believes exists, but it has to be there because it's a four box square and have followed a similar route to suggest that 
short acting bronchodilators if you have mild, long acting bronchodilators if you have moderate, and then if you've got frequent exacerbations, that either a LAMA or dual bronchodilator would be our first choice over and above a LABA ICS. And this is based on, on the gold guidelines and the, and the studies that were available, but also the cognizance that inhaled corticosteroids increase your risk for pneumonia. There's data in relation to inhaled corticosteroids and tuberculosis, and also then the concerns in these elderly patients uh, with relation to osteoporosis, uh, diabetes, and so to try and avoid the LABA ICS unless there is a specific reason why you wish to choose it. And so why that choice? Well, as I said, COPD is thought to be a airways disease. And I explained to my patients that it's a floppy airways and damaged sponge condition. So the goal is to pharmacologically stent the airways so that we can give you the best option in terms of getting the air into the lungs um, and obviously then once in the lungs into the blood. If you have more sponge problem, as in emphysema, and you've lost alveoli, then the bronchodilators are not necessarily going to work particularly well, but then neither will the steroids. So the preference currently is dual bronchodilators for the majority of patients. And as I uh, indicated, many people would suggest that you just start them, once they've got moderate COPD, just start them on a combination of two bronchodilators and call it quits, rather than waiting for them to deteriorate before adding up. Who should be getting an inhaled corticosteroid? Well, the indications are really moving further and further and further down the treatment algorithm. Um, and certainly patients with mild COPD should not be on an inhaled corticosteroid. There's very little indication for putting a patient on an inhaled corticosteroid without a bronchodilator. One of the challenges we face is the access to medication. And so finding a bronchodilator without an inhaled corticosteroid is difficult. And um, inhaled corticosteroids are so easily available and doctors feel that they want to do something, so they put a patient on an inhaled corticosteroid. Certainly in the patients that are frequently exacerbating, this seems to be a place and probably in the context of triple therapy is where inhaled corticosteroids would be of value. The chronic bronchitis or the eosinophilic or history of asthma potentially is another space where an inhaled corticosteroid would be uh, recommended, but again, probably in the context of triple therapy rather than dual therapy. And then ultimately it comes down to a cost versus benefit versus harm. If you look at the cost of a uh, LABA LAMA versus a cost of a LABA ICS, it is a significantly cheaper option to go for a LABA ICS. And the absolute risk reduction um, is not that high. So I don't think in the frequently exacerbating patient, if we only have access to a LABA ICS, we are necessarily doing our patients uh, huge harm but obviously the not unavailability or lack of use of dual bronchodilators does mean that we're exposing our patients unnecessarily to a burden of inhaled corticosteroids. And if you are gonna prescribe inhaled corticosteroids, it really should be at COPD doses, which are significantly lower than that which we would use in asthma. So those of you who know the Star Wars um, universe will be aware that the final Star Wars episode really didn't give us final answers. And so there is no final answer ultimately uh, in COPD, unfortunately, at this particular point. What I think we need to be doing locally, obviously advocating for smoking cessation. One of the biggest challenges we've had in both asthma and COPD is a lack of access to, let alone appropriate, just consistent supply of medication. Um, and patients frequently are given an IOU for their inhalers and just told, sorry, it's not available, or they get substituted. There is uh, work afoot to get a pulmonary rehabilitation program going. And we also need, I think, with this change in emphasis um, around COPD, to really get away from this um, need to put patients with COPD 
on inhaled corticosteroids. And we see it across the board in student exams, junior doctors who put patients on inhaled corticosteroids unnecessarily. And there's obviously a lot of research that needs to be done in our context, as well as advocacy for this. And then just in my last slide, I want to give you a sense of where we are going in 2021 and the challenges that face us. And so traditionally, COPD has been seen as a smoking disease. I showed you the lung function trajectory graphs that came out in 2019. Uh, Alvaro Gusti and colleagues from, from Barcelona put those together. And what we are seeing now is a greater understanding, which creates more challenges in terms of, of management, that there is a whole group of patients who have chronic airflow limitation not only as a result from smoking, but as a result from significant exposure to other um, things, both at occupation, biomass exposure, there are genetic um, inherited traits, there are recurrent childhood infections, and even your exposure in utero, whether your mother smoked when you were a fetus, impacts on long-term lung function. And so we have got significant work to do to try and understand what this chronic airflow limitation actually is, whether our assumptions based on the smoking trials or smoking related COPD trials, so to enter a clinical trial, you need to have smoked significantly, whether we can transfer or extrapolate the understanding and the sort of phenotyping of whether you're a more breathless patient or a more chronic sputum producing exacerbation patient across into this real mixture of diseases um, broadly labeled chronic airflow limitation that are poorly defined um, but impact significantly on patients. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of um, our COPD understanding but I think globally now people are starting to recognize that it's more than just smoking and certainly still trying to find the best option for our individual patient remains a challenge. So Graham, I'm gonna stop there and I'm more than happy to take any questions. But, uh, thanks very much, Richard. That was an excellent and, and timeless update and, and a lot of really important points for the generalist uh, that I think, um, you know, who don't follow this field as closely as, as the pulmonologists do uh, to sort of integrate into our uh, practice um, going forward. Um, before I, I move on to the questions, I just want to alert everybody on the, the uh, call that um, we are um, reinstituting the CPD points for these uh, meetings. Um, but obviously, we can't have a register for you to fill in as you enter the lecture room. Uh, but Sahana has uh, put together a Google Docs a document um, and put the link in the chat function. Um, and that link will be active for the next uh, hour and a half. So if you just want to uh, go into that link and just register that you've attended, uh, then we can keep a, a CPD register. Um, so Richard, if I could ask the first question, um, and you, you kind of alluded to, but just to give a bit more details about the issue of accessibility of uh, these medications within the public sector, um, in terms of what, uh, I, I, you know, I know that uh, there, there's the uh, stockouts, but more what what's actually in the um, uh, available uh, with, 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 within the, the public sector and, and, and uh, in, in terms of the tenders. Oh, okay. So Graham, that's a vexed question, and I could probably go on for another hour on that. Essentially, well, there are two issues. So on tender at the moment is um, a LABA ICS. So we have, I think, and it changes all the time, salmitrol fluticasone as serotide, salmitrol fluticasone as, some, as um, seroflow, so PMDI and dry powder. Symbicort, filmotrol budesonide, is also available. I'm not sure if it's on tender at the moment. We did not have a LABA on. We used to have formotrol, but Cipla had a problem with its supply, and so formotrol was lost, but Novartis brought Indicatrol. So Indicatrol is a once-daily LABA that's available. Um, Seabree, which is glycopyronium, 
is a once daily llama is actually on tender, but it's not on the EML. And mm. so in our context, if it's on tender, but not on the EML, we don't have access to it. It uh, seems to be a Western Cape thing compared to a country thing. And there is some uh, degree of where people are trying to, u um, to unify sort of national approaches. So essentially we're stuck with a LABA and a LABA ICS is what I have available. I haven't even mentioned Theophylline. It doesn't come into global guidelines and suggestions. We use it because it's available. It kind of is half a bronchodilator, half a uh, inhaled corticosteroid in terms of its action. If vent has been taken away, it's only available for um, inpatient usage. So really I'm stuck with a LABA ICS as my therapy for, for COPD, mm -hmm. which apart from the fact that access is challenging, uh, it's wholly inadequate, unfortunately, for, for the management um, of COPD because we don't have anywhere to go. Patients will be started if they don't have a LABA, will be started on something like Seroflow and referred to a respiratory clinic to please assist with management of COPD and I have nothing to add. Um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's exceedingly frustrating. We've been working on this for years and we continue to, but it's a, it's a very difficult and sore point at the moment. Mm. And Richard, can you just, um, if I can just say to colleagues, if you have questions, uh, uh, to post them in the chat function, I'll, I'll come to Gary's question now. Um, but j just on the issue of the ICS and the risk, uh, of TB, um, you mentioned that, but is it a substantial risk? So Graham, that's a, it's a fascinating question. There is a Korean meta-analysis that shows that it is. But I have, and I, I use this example often, I've been doing clinical trials at the Lung Institute for the last, whatever it is, 12 years now. I have had one patient on a clinical trial for asthma or COPD that's developed TB. The respiratory clinic is not full with patients who are getting TB. And so whether or not in our context, the added risk of an inhaled corticosteroid is nowhere near the added risk of having, you know, on top of um, smoking being HIV positive, that the additive risk is probably negligent in our context. And I think that probably is the answer. Whereas in Korea, they seem to see um, and have documented that TB is associated with inhaled corticosteroids. But if you ask any South African pulmonologist, they will tell you that we've seen the data, but we just don't see those patients. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure that it is a, a significant risk in our context. Okay. Um, yeah, so if I can move on to, to Gary's question. Uh, Gary asked, you know, that very much goes back to your last slide. What is the evidence base for treating COPD not due to smoking, e.g. post TB or biomass fuel exposure? So there's very little data. Um, there are patients in these large international studies who've had TB. There are patients who've been exposed to biomass, but they will all have smoked. Um, there is some process afoot to try and interrogate these international databases to try and pull out the post TBs and see if they behave differently. Uh, Brian Orwood and I in the Lung Institute, we've done some work in post-TB obstructive lung disease. Um, but even that is not a, a single entity. There's a wide spectrum of disease. Um, using formotrol um, and looking at, in, at, at oral steroids, they didn't seem to be particularly effective. Um, I have a study that I'm looking for funding for to look at now the new... Um, dual bronchodilators, so maximum bronchodilatation in these patients may be of benefit, but they are difficult to characterize. And the problem is they're often very messy. So to find a pure biomass exposed person without TB who hasn't smoked or a TB person who hasn't had exposure to biomass and smoked is very, very difficult to find neat groups. And the only way to get around that then is to have a massive study, which obviously costs a whole lot and is not really a priority for um, international pharmaceuticals because we don't provide a big enough uh, market. But I think there is increasing interest in this group 
but the challenge would be the entry criteria into a study as to how you define them um, as to what they are, as to get a clear answer. Hmm. Having said that, let me, I, I, I happened to, as I said, I was on this webinar last week uh, uh, with Alvaro Agusti and I asked him this particular question. Um, how do we translate the guidelines to our practice? And the goal guidelines are very much based on symptoms. It's a symptom driven guideline rather than a diagnosis. So if you are short of breath, you get this. If you're a frequent exacerbator, so almost like a phenotypical treatment rather than a um, rather than a specific diagnostic criteria and he seemed to think and I think I agree similarly that if you think this is predominantly a a airflow limitation thing then you would go with a bronchodilator if you think this is a particularly inflammatory chronic bronchitis thing you might want to go with a steroid so I think we extrapolate across based on what we know, but that's very much um, untested uh, and unproven. But I would be loath to go in with a high dose inhaled corticosteroids in someone with previous TB without very good reasons to do so. And then uh, a, a question from Tasneem Bana. Uh, Tasneem asks if you can comment on the comparative e efficacy of, of glycopyronium uh, versus tiotrophim? So the only studies that have looked head to head with TO and glycopyronium are the original registration studies of Novartis, which was CBRI. Um, and the study was done in a non-inferiority manner. And the glycopyronium is non-inferior to tiotropium. Interestingly, Glycoperonium has a very quick onset of action. And um, you will see, if you're looking in the asthma literature, how very quickly, within five minutes, you get significant bronchodilatation. So um, the um, basic position at the moment is that glycoperonium works as well as teotropium. It's never been shown to be better, per se, in COPD, but no one's ever going to do that study. Um, but it does work faster. And at the moment, it is significantly cheaper. Uh, so it, is, it tends to be our go-to because of um, cost. Mm -hmm. um, and then at, at, I see uh, Bol has, has, has posted a question and it kind of links into a question, a broader question that I had. If, if you could say something about um, some of the key points um, on the approach to management of the acute ac exacerbations, both in hospital and, and at discharge. Um, and then Bill's asking any place for azithromycin, um, you know, either acutely or chronically. So let me ask the chronic question first. So Zithromax, azithromycin has been shown to reduce exacerbations in those that have chronic cough, sputum production and exacerbations. Um, it's not something we use easily also in those studies, they're always on top of at least double, if not triple therapy. So you don't really want to put a patient on Theophylline and Zithromax without having them on a Lava and a Lama, as it were. So I wouldn't advocate it uh, as a good thing to use in patients with COPD unless they are on um, decent background therapy. And then as with chronic azithromycin usage, the concerns of cardiovascular ototoxicity and development of drug resistance um, is something we wouldn't be that excited about. And then again, in patients with structural lung disease, previous TB, throwing a macrolide into that mix will potentially mess up your options if they develop a non-tuberculous mycobacterium or drug-resistant TB, where you may start getting um, impact um, collateral damage in terms of other antibiotics. Graham, in terms of acute exacerbations, I mean, really nothing has changed. The approach is still pretty much exactly the same when you were at medical school, um, that you give them um, bronchodilator, either uh, nebulized or PMDI. At the moment, we're not advocating uh, using nebulizers because of the potential risk for COVID aerosolization, and that's also a lecture in and of itself. Um, short course of antibiotics, short course of um, oral corticosteroids, so somewhere in the region of 30 or 40 milligrams three to five days is kind of where we're at. So shorter 
certainly not big doses because as I said, they just cause um, side effects generally. And then the issue of who should get a, an antibiotic or not, whether they have purulent sputum or not. And unfortunately, purulence of sputum is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and so we generally tend to give our patients with COPD, corticosteroids and um, antibiotics. Certainly, I think if you're being admitted, you probably should. In terms of which, um, even something simply like doxycycline or augmented would be absolutely fine. Again, we probably would avoid quinolones and uh, macrolides just because of um, you know, drug resistance and antibiotic stewardship, unless you have a very good reason uh, to want to use them. And if they fall in the community acquired pneumonia group, well, then you'd follow those kind of guidelines. Hmm. I mean, do, do you not think they, just from the antibiotic stewardship point of view, that we should be looking to limit uh, the use of antibiotics um, to only certain patients with COPD exacerbations uh, based on, on biomarkers? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think if you admit it, absolutely. Uh, in terms of biomarkers, the challenge is there, which biomarker are you going to look at? And even if you look at uh, the community-acquired pneumonia guidelines, you know, sending off CRPs and PCTs aren't necessarily that easy to, to do. But absolutely, unless there's a good indication for it. And what we're really looking for is a change in purulence of sputum. Remember that if you get increased lymphocytes in your sputum, it is going to go slightly yellow because of those. Um, and so patients with, you know, good going green, brown sputum is probably where antibiotics um, are indicated. Whether or not sending off a culture is of help or not, again, for community acquired pneumonia, you generally don't send off a sputum culture. But certainly in patients who have frequent exacerbations, uh, sputum culture is of value. One, to see if they're colonized, where well, you may wish to go for a longer course to try and eradicate, although that doesn't generally work particularly well, and or have they developed a um, resistant pathogen. But it's not something we see uh, an enormous amount. Mm. I mean, you know, I just think, you know, a lot, some, a proportion of the exacerbations must surely be due to purely viral infections. And um, clearly we, we want to avoid antibiotics in those, those particular patients. So. Absolutely. Um, it doesn't seem that there are any more questions unless I'm just going to check if anybody's got their hand up. I, I don't see anything further on the chat function. So um, just to say thanks very much, Richard, again, a, a fantastic overview and, and really useful for us um, as, as generalists, some important points there. Uh, and we'll be having our next uh, meeting uh, next week, which I think is a business meeting. So thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you.